Right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's meeting of the North Wales Police and Crime Panel. Can I remind members that translation facilities are available? Um, I've also got on here now to welcome Councillor Elwyn Jones from Gwynedd Council. But I think we did that last last meeting, but we're still waiting for confirmation from the Welsh Office, uh, and we're taking that up with the Welsh Office to try and hurry that along. Now, uh, before I hand over to Pat to, to Dawn for the apologies. Can I just say I received a phone call from Pat Asprey this morning. Unfortunately, Pat's mother died last night, so she's unable to attend today. Um, so if it's all right with everybody, we'll send her a letter of condolence from the panel if everybody's in agreement with that. Thank you. And then, so move to item one. Apologies for absence, Dawn. Thank you, Chair. We've had apologies from councillors Steve Coppel, Nigel Williams, and of course, Pat. And item two, declarations of interest, code of local government conduct. Members are reminded that they must declare the existence and nature of their, of their declared personal interests. Uh, yes, my husband uh, works for North Wales Police. Anybody else? No. Item three, there are no urgent matters that I'm aware of. Item four, announcements by the chair. Uh, the only thing I would say is that the, you had the 50th anniversary open day of the North Wales Police uh, it Saturday, uh, and I think it was a, a good event. I went in the morning. I was amazed at how many people were there. Uh, and the one thing which really sort of pleased me, really, there was a stall there, which was manned by Bangor University, given the police, policing degrees and the number of young people who have gone around that stall all the time. It sort of made you think, yeah, we're OK for the future, you know. So it was really, really good. And I think it went off very well. So thank you. Um, item five, the minutes, pages three to five. Can we approve to approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 21st of June? Can I remind members that the minutes are for approval only and not for discussion? Is there a proposer and a seconder? Yeah. Councillor Buffall proposes. I'm trying to second the interview. Thank you. And can I ask the members to show their hands if they agree with the minutes? Yeah, everybody's agreed. Thank you. Uh, st item six, standing agenda items. Six A is questions to the Police and Crime Commissioner. Uh, in line with the protocol, only myself and Councillor Terry Harper can ask a supplementary question because we asked the, the previous questions. Uh, there should be no discussion on the questions. I've got no uh, further questions on it, and I haven't heard from, from Carrie, so we'll go forward with that one again then. And the next one is update and actions from the previous meeting. And the last, Stephen, CEO, if there are any updates and actions to be reported, please. Uh, no actions from the previous meeting that I could see, Chair, and I, I did double-check the, uh, the actions and minutes from the January meeting as well, just to ensure that there was nothing that was left outstanding and uh, stand to be corrected, but I think everything's up to date, Chair. Obviously, Pat can't can't give an update at the moment. Just a non David, you got none. Have you got any updates at all? Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I did have an update from Rian in July, noting that they had been in discussions with the uh, information assurance uh, section with regards to the um, North Wales matters. This department is happy. Um, so there's a lot of work to do to ensure that this happens, and we hope that I will be able to attend um, at the end of October, maybe beginning of November. Speaking to Wayne and Rian, I realised how happy they are to scrutinise the service as they come into connection with the police, and um, they are keen to... Uh, tackle problems sooner to ensure that matters do not worsen. It has been a period where we have been taking our annual leave, but this team has assured that they uh, continue to improve the experience of victims. In the next meeting, I hope I will be able to report on the experience of listening in to the victims panel in North Wales, but I won't be declaring any uh, personal matters. Thank you. I'll say, Chris, if you want. I mean, we uh, spoken with Steve, and there's a meeting being arranged as we speak now. 
Um, so yeah. we'll have an update on the next meeting in terms of that. I move now to uh, Councillor Louise Emery. Uh, I'll just give my budget update after Kate's talked yeah. through the budget later. Fine, thank you. Thank you for that. Now move to item seven, which is a presentation on cybercrime by Detective Inspector Yolo Edwards from the North West Police. And uh, over to you, Yolo. We're looking forward to this. <laughs> Yeah, well, good afternoon, everyone. I think Dawn's going to share this, the presentation slides behind you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, speak to you today. I estimate this will take about 20 minutes to go through, so um, it's probably a bit shorter than most of the presentations I do on this subject area, to be honest with you. Um, which may may not be a bad thing. So it's advertised as a cybercrime uh, presentation, um, but I have to cover uh, more widely the work of the Economic Crime Unit, which cybercrime is now part of, uh, to hopefully um, convey uh, the work that's going on across the various streams and the role the cybercrime plays within it. Um, it is a, quite a complex picture that doesn't have any geographical or law enforcement boundaries. Um, so there is a lot of uh, collaboration between uh, law enforcement in the UK and in terms of the NCA across international boundaries. So if, next slide, please, Don. Okay, so this, uh, this slide is just a, a quick summary of the threat as it poses to the UK. So in 22, 23, UK businesses and individuals uh, reported a loss to action fraud totaling 2.48 billion. Uh, this includes cyber dependent crime, and that gives you an idea of the sheer scale of money that is involved in uh, this type of cr uh, criminality and how much of an impact it is having on the UK. Um, it's an area of business that we've always got to constantly change our approach and keep up to date with innovations because the criminals are. You know, we've got things like artificial intelligence, which are now coming into play, um, and the cyber and fraud criminals are constantly testing uh, the processes that um, financial institutions and businesses put in place and try and find the weak spot in order to um, commit the crime in the first place. So my staff have to make sure that they are aware of the trends um, that are impacting on our community. Um, action fraud is uh, managed by the National um, Fraud Intelligence Bureau. Um, that is the re reporting and recording mechanism for fraud and cyber in the UK. Um, and a lot of the data comes from that avenue today. The slide on the on the right hand slide in the blue there are some of the main examples of the types of, cr of criminality that we see. Um, apologies if we sat on the back here, they are quite um, difficult to read, uh, but I'll read them out. So you have hacking, including social media hacking. Uh, computer and viruses, malware, spyware, ransomware, consumer fraud, investment fraud, courier fraud, romance fraud, and money mules. The um, most common fraud type that we encounter in North Wales is consumer fraud. This is uh, where people are utilising um, shopping sites um, to, to scam people out of money by, by offering goods which simply do not exist. The other one that people often ask for an explanation about is money mewling. Uh, this is where individuals are encouraged by the criminals um, to provide a bank account, which allows the criminal to move money through the financial sector with limited contact with the criminals themselves. Uh, individuals are offered a small fee, want to a better phrase, to either use their existing bank account or to open a new account. The, the process of opening an account now takes merely seconds online. Um, so it is an area of weakness in the financial sector that we are constantly trying to address. Next slide, please. Um, so in this slide, um, I'll give you an idea of how uh, NFIB record the uh, fences. As you can see the, on the um, pie chart on the left, um, we have um, fraud, uh, the crime type. So cyber dependent crime, which are the cyber t crime team are actually measured upon accounts for only 10% of all fraud and cyber. 90% um, of the crime is, is recorded as fraud. 
However, if you move over to the other slide, you will see that 66% is cyber enabled. Uh, that means that the crime that has been committed has used some sort of electronic device. So the role of cybercrime team in protecting the communities is much, much vaster than uh, the 10% that involves uh, cyber dependent crime. Hacking, computer misuse is classed as cyber dependent. The other crime types that we deal with are classed as cyber enabled. Move on, please. Um, this is a demographic, um, just a, a snapshot of the, the demographics of um, the, the victims that are reporting. Um, so the slide on the left is the gender breakdown. Um, I'm afraid it doesn't cover um, s sort of uh, some of the, some of the uh, information that perhaps we, we may wish to have beyond male and female. Um, so the split is 40-34 with more women reporting. The unknowns, 26, will involve, include businesses, um, of which about 10% of all crime involves a business. Um, other than any further information and breakdown in terms of gender, I, have, I don't have that to hand. If we move over to the right, that is the age profile of victims. Um, obviously, at the left-hand side is those aged 10 to 19. Thankfully, given the fact it's young people, it is very much the smallest demographic there but in terms of the rest of the age profile it is pretty level um, in, in, in actual fact of the age profile um, the only thing that we do see is that older people tend to lose more per fraud offence um, simply because by nature of it um, the, the loss tends to be greater because they may have a, a better balance within their accounts um, but this is a, a, you know, a, an illustration, if you like, of the, the fact that the cyber criminals, the uh, fraudsters, do not care who they target. They simply want the money. We move on. So I talked a bit about the, the challenges and, and, this, and the victims there, but our structures. On the right-hand side is the structure of um, North Wales Police, where we sit. So we are part of Crime Services. Um, so I'm answer ultimately answerable outside the MPC office to the Head of Crime Services, which is Detective Chief Superintendent Beck. Uh, below that, we are part of Force Intelligence, um, and I have four work streams that I am responsible for, fraud, financial, cyber, and digital. But it's not just within North Wales Police um, that we have structures in place. The national leads for um, economic crime are the National Economic Crime Centre, who are part of the national crime agencies. Um, that also includes the national cybercrime cyber crime units. Um, so they set the um, tone for our response across the country. The police force that leads on this area of business is City of London Police, um, not surprisingly, and they are the ones that um, provide training for the rest of the police forces in England and Wales. North Wales are part of the Northwest Regional Organised Crime Unit. Um, so we feed in quarterly uh, information and meet with them and the six uh, police forces within the Northwest, where possible, um, uh, collaborate uh, uh, extensively to try and deal with this problem. We have quarterly meetings and also, which is obviously at the INDCI level, but also the practitioners, uh, the constables and the sergeants have monthly tactical meetings and the purpose of those meetings to discuss crime trends that are occurring nationally and across the region, but also to identify blockers um, which may be impeding an investigation from moving ahead. Certain crime types we also meet nationally um, to deal with it. There is one fraud type which is um, which is falls within that category. Uh, example of, of good practice: uh, force from east of England uh, raised an issue recently at a meeting. Uh, in, face of blocker that they were experiencing and it was a, an issue that we'd encountered in North Wales some months previously uh, so we were able to um, meet with them outside that meeting discuss the problem and suggest some ways to resolve it and they were able to take their, their inquiry forward next slide please um, I've set these slides out in the 4p um, basis and that is the basis of dealing with organised crime because ultimately fraud and cyber has a great deal of organisation behind it. So the principle is prepare, prevent, protect and pursue. 
So preparation is about how we in North Wales Police are prepared to deal with this crime type and also um, how we can support um, other departments across the force. So my business area staffing is at 100%, um, which is always a good start. Um, and when we advertise for vacancies, we are subscribed, subscribed in applications, which is a good position to be in from my position because um, through the interview process, I'm comfortable then that I'm getting the best person for that job from that pool of uh, applicants. Um, the cost of training in the economic crime field is quite high. Um, so we do require a four year staff commitment from officers um, to ensure that we are getting value for money and the best out of our investment. Um, some forces do uh, report a staff retention issue. Uh, the skills that people are um, gaining in this role are quite desirable in the private sector, um, but that's not something that's impacted North Wales to date. Um, geography probably plays quite a significant part in that, um, but it's obviously uh, a good reflection of the investment that we're putting into them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, City of London Police are responsible for the training of the staff. Um, so as a region, we are trying to keep the cost down to send an officer to London for a week or two week course does bring with it some uh, additional costs in travel and accommodation, of course. So what we are trying to do is uh, coordinate our training requirements in the Northwest, host the, um, the training within one of the force uh, training units and then pay for the, the trainer to come up. Um, which will save um, all the six forces a bit of money. Um, outside economic crime, um, obviously we've got a responsibility to make sure that as best as possible, we are providing the best service we can to our victims. Um, and so we do provide CPD training in fraud and cyber to our core handlers within the force control room. You'll see that in the top um, photograph there, um, which helps them to better support the, um, the victim from that first call for service. Um, we've also instigated a dedicated uh, training day for economic crime unit within uh, the Need Recruits programme. Um, so for all four areas of business now provide their training in one specific day. Um, we're a relatively new department within North Wales Police. Um, we've only been in ex existence since 2021. Um, so it's very important from our perspective to um, bring that identity as a, as a department um, to the new recruits. Um, and the most important thing for them, of course, is that um, when they encounter an issue which is relevant to us, they know who to ask. And that is always the biggest thing within policing is that you there is no way that anybody can know all the answers, but that they know who to come to for to get that um, answer themselves. Next slide, please. Um, this slide, just again, in terms of the um, collaborative working across all the uh, police forces in the Northwest. Um, so as a result of the last strategic meeting, a number of um, areas um, were, were discussed that we're performing um, pretty well as a region, but obviously we're always looking to continuously improve our service and uh, the way we, we deal with this area of business. So each force is owning a project at the moment um, to look at better um, service to the public and um, better outcomes for people reporting this type of crime. Um, the one I've taken away is to look at how volunteers and cyber specials, special constables, uh, can work in this environment. Um, we've got a very good citizens in policing program, program in North Wales. And we're a bit of an outlier as a cyber team in that we've had the volunteers as part of the team for a good couple of years now. Uh, which is unusual in a specialist role. Um, there is a lot of benefit to having volunteers and our volunteers have um, our cyber professionals themselves in their day job. So they have a certain uh, knowledge that a police officer is simply not going to be able to uh, provide. So they're a good source of information in terms of our investigations. Um, the benefit of this approach is, of course, uh, when we all report back, we every force will benefit from each um, assessment um, so we can improve our working practices across cyber and ECU in the Northwest. Next slide, please. Just quickly gonna touch on um, fraud and uh, financial investigation. So all frauds um, 
that are sent to action fraud are disseminated um, to relevant force. So those that are disseminated to North Wales Police, we, as part of the Economic Crime Unit, will triage those to identify the best opportunities for investigation and the correct ownership. So if a inquiry requires a detective resource, we will allocate accordingly. Uh, and also, if it, if it is suitable for a, a patrol officer, allocate to that um, resource as well. The triage officers are fraud specialists, so there is that ongoing support um, for uh, those investigations as they are um, progressed. Uh, the FASO officer, these are financial abuse safeguarding officers. I will touch more on, on their role in the protect uh, part of my update. Um, but they also assess all incoming opportunities for opportunities to disrupt um, and to stop any further loss taking place. So it's a very um, demanding role. So in quarter one of this year, April, May, June, uh, 198 fraud reports were reviewed by the trials officers. Um, NFIB give us a judicial outcome position for 23-24 of 4.5%, which, which puts us in line with the average for England and Wales. Um, I have to um, put a little bit of a health warning on that one. As inquiries progress, um, that will change. So as um, people are dealt with, that will likely go up. Um, they also give us a five-year average as well. Um, and currently that average is at 8.1. Um, moving on to financial investigation, um, really important part. These are the officers that deal with proceeds of crimes. Uh, invest investigations um, and in the 23-24 financial year as a result of their inquiries 361,237 was uh, returned to North Wales Police. Uh, North Wales Police re uh, receive a percentage of the actual money that's taken from the criminal um, so the actual amount taken will be much higher um, but in, you know in terms of what North Wales Police receive back from Pocker um, that was the number. And in quarter one this year, we've already made a good start with £85,000 uh, returned to the force. Um, earlier this year, the Economic Crime Bill came into force, which allows um, law enforcement to seize cryptocurrency. Um, the cryptocurrency um, exchanges are looking to come more in line with reg regulation, uh, and this is part and parcel of it. Um, this is an example of where having a settled, experienced workforce helps um, because before the Economic Crime Bill came into force, um, my staff made sure that they were familiar with the legislation. And it was a financial investigator from North Wales that was the first in the UK to successfully obtain an asset freezing order in court for cryptocurrency, which is obviously a good result for us. Next slide, please. Um, so that's just a, a, a visualization of the amount of investigations that are going on across the Northwest. So we've got 16 active investigations in cyber only. Um, so as you can see, apart from the two metropolitan port forces of Merseyside and Greater Manchester, the, man, the demand is pretty similar across the other four forces. Um, the graph on the bottom right is disruptions. So where we disrupt criminality, then we record it because anything that we do that will disrupt um, that type of criminality is is where we take in positive action against organised crime. So in quarter one, 150 occur occasions where we've disrupted organised criminality. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Prevent is a national um, project um, which is uh, managed by the National Crime Agency. Um, this is to deal with individuals who are dipping their toes into um, cybercrime. So we're talking about young people with an interest or some knowledge in uh, computers who are using that um, knowledge to commit low-level offences. Um, the best way to deal with those individuals is to um, stop that activity as early as possible um, and divert them away from criminality. Um, so that they are not offending and causing a demand on the criminal justice system at a later date. Uh, we are measured on the number of people that we refer into um, the programme. 
Um, the graph on the left is a is a cumulative total for the northwest of how many people have been referred into the program. Uh, so 84 in total at the end of Q1, uh, 27 of whom have been accepted onto the um, Prevent Cyber Choices program. Uh, we have referred a couple of young people from North Wales in the last quarter, um, and obviously they're currently being assessed for suitability. Next slide, please. Um, so this is some of the protect work that is going on uh, within predominantly the cyber team. Um, we've got an extremely active protect uh, team in North Wales, um, and their job is to go out there, speak to uh, individuals and businesses to ensure that they're protecting themselves as best as possible from this type of criminality. Um, during first quarter, they had 3,732 attendees at Protect Engagement events. These engagement events um, involve attending schools, uh, community groups, um, various um, senior management teams have had this input, um, and also looking at other options to speak to the community of North Wales. Uh, we've developed a very good working relationship with the farmers' unions, um, and for the second year running, um, the NFU hosted uh, a space for us at their business area at the Royal Welsh Show. Um, this was at, as a result of the um, good working relationship that Dewi Owen has developed with them. Um, obviously, it is in Bilth Wells, um, so it's a North Wales um, uh, audience, if you like. Uh, and we also uh, invited along uh, cyber officers from River Powys, uh, Tarian, which is the regional organised crime unit for Southern Wales, Gwent and South Wales, who are more than happy to support. Um, we've, the one uh, bonus for ourselves, obviously, is that having a, our own trade stand there would be expensive, but the NFU were quite happy to provide that area free of charge. Um, a great deal of engagement, uh, and as some of you know, um, there's a significant proportion of the population in North Wales that attend the Royal Welsh every year. We also had a presence at the three main shows uh, across North Wales as well, Ernest Morn, uh, Flint and Denby, and Mary A um, couple of other things to point out there. So the financial abuse safeguarding officers that I mentioned earlier, um, their role is to identify and manage the response for victims of fraud. Um, so during the first quarter, they've um, reviewed our response to 167 identified victims of fraud. 26% uh, of those were assessed as vulnerable in some way. Um, they will manage how we respond to that and how many, much engagement is required. Um, some individuals require advice. There are some offence types, romance fraud being a particular problem, but because of the very nature of the offending, uh, the victims struggle to accept that they are a victim of crime and so the engagement that is need needed is at a much greater level and we involve our partners in uh, local authorities and social services and the financial sector um, to protect those individuals uh, where we can. Uh, the NECVCU which is uh, whose logo is there, they're the victim care unit for action fraud. Uh, North Wales Police have signed up um, to their um, services um, 18 months ago now, I think, um, and they provide um, support um, for some of our vulnerable victims as well. Um, move on, next slide, please. Okay, the Cyber Resilience Centre was set up um, about four years ago, um, and this is um, an initiative to provide um, cyber advice and support to businesses across the UK, each um, constituent area of uh, England and Wales has a, a cyber resilience centre. Um, we are in a position in North Wales, of, of course, where we, um, some of our functions are with the North West re uh, region and others are with Wales. For the purpose of the cyber resilience centre, uh, we are part of an all Wales um, approach. Um, we are judged on the number of, of businesses we refer to the Cyber Resilience Centre. Um, and our approach, very simply, is once a month, uh, the protect officers will 
visit a given area um, and try and visit as many businesses as possible within that area um, to advise them about the CRC. And um, if they're willing to do so, they have to agree uh, to refer them to the C CRC. You will see in that photo there, some of you may recognize Adamao, Danny Mirionid, um, with Dewi uh, and Paul Hill from the CRC were visiting businesses earlier this year. Uh, where possible, we also involve the local neighborhood policing team um, to come along as well, because again, it's an opportunity for businesses um, to have that contact with the neighborhood policing team, because um, there are always other issues that may need to be raised um, that, that can be dealt with at the time. And all the neighborhood policing teams in North Wales are always very supportive of, of this. Uh, the graph on the top left is a record of the number of referrals um, by the police forces in the northwest here. So we are actually marked alongside the northwest. It's a bit of an anomaly, but um, it, it is what it is. And the graph at, and the line at the top in green is North Wales. Um, and as you will see from that, until Merseyside um, increased their referrals in the last quarter, we were uh, referring pretty much more than more businesses than any of the other five forces put together. So it's a real, a real strong initiative by the team to try and uh, support our businesses uh, from cybercrime. Um, final slide here, Dawn. I had to mention this one. Um, so there we, it's a very um, busy protect officer to say the least. Um, and I'm pleased to say that his work both in the protect field and as a mentor for our volunteers has um, attracted attention. Um, so the MPCC uh, Commissioner's Choice Award, um, the National Cyber Awards, which take place a week today. Um, and he's been nominated as a finalist for that award. It is a national award, quite coveted in the cyber field to say the least. Uh, and he's one of four finalists for that event uh, down in London next week. Um, his work ethic is outstanding um, and the number of individuals and businesses that he has supported um, over the last two to three years um, is the envy of the other forces in the Northwest. So it's really great to see him being recognized at that level. Um, so obviously we wish him well in that. Um, so that is a quick run through uh, my area of business. Um, as I said to you before, this is quite a quick run through, to say the least. And I'm happy to take any questions. And if they are in Welsh, I will answer in Cymraeg as well. Thank you for that, Yola. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of questions, if I may, <laughs> to begin with. It's just sort of get my head around exactly what, what happened. So I'll give you another, uh, an example, if I can. So there's a small charity in Mould or Wrexham, doesn't matter where. The books are audited and they found that there's a fraud on their, say, 20, 30,000 pounds. Trustee rings the police. What happens then? Okay, so they would, in that scenario, if they contact North Wales Police, um, that case would come to the fraud officers for review of the, of the, the uh, fraud, you know, yeah. we would look at the evidence. Um, we have a fraud policy in North Wales, which a lot of forces haven't taken that step. So we have a framework to work to as to um, what investigations, um, how fraud investigations are dealt with. Um, and, you know, we would look at it from the basis of, obviously, it, are the police the, the right people in that circumstances? And there are other um, regulatory um, bodies, such as in that case, could be the Charity Commission. But obviously, if there's offences, we would look at um, the best possible approach to resolving that case and who should own that case. Well, it's a straightforward theft of false accounts. Presumably. Well, it, you yeah. Give that out back up to division. Yeah, so it would be a, a division. I would imagine with that level of money, uh, the you've also got the um, abuse of trust in that in that situation with a an organisation's money. It would go to a divisional resource to investigate. Okay, good. thanks. That's okay. Good. The second one is sort of it, it, about six weeks ago. I got a phone phone call from Vodafone. It said Vodafone on my phone, but it wasn't from Vodafone. It was a scam call. I realised it was scam, and I terminated the call. Rang Vodafone. And they confirmed it was a scam. But had they asked me for my bank details and they'd taken money and I found I'd been scammed, I ring North Wales Police. 
What actually happens to that? Who investigates that? Okay, depends on the circumstances. So obviously, we would refer the matter to Action Broad because we, you know, they they are the re reporting recording mechanism for um, for that type of offence. We would always also ensure that the individual concerned had reported the matter to their bank because they have their responsibilities in order, in relation to the security of the account, and obviously. It's a matter for the individual financial um, uh, organisation. If you've been a victim of crime, they then have to consider, is it your fault or not? And whether or not that individual is at a loss or not. Um, but who actually tries to catch the offenders in that particular case? OK, so first and foremost, the bank would make, um, have their own investigation teams. So they look at where that money has gone because the financial um, the financial network, for want of a better phrase, that money will move through the financial system in one way or the other. Okay, so where is that money going? Has it remained in the UK? So if the money has gone from your account to an account, say, in Essex, well, potentially the, the offender is in Essex when the offence has happened, so it will be disseminated to Essex Police to investigate. And who would the bank liaise with? Would they liaise with North Wales, or they would they would they would liaise with Essex Police in that in so that circumstances. So you wouldn't necessarily know about what was we we may we may have limited. We would be notified through the the FASO process of we have a victim of crime in North Wales. So then the FASO officers would then review the matter, assess what safeguarding support is needed, because uh, the main the main. The main target for us in those situations is to stop any further loss. Yeah. You know, if you've lost a hundred pounds, then we need to if we need to take measures to stop it becoming two hundred pounds. Yeah. So that's where our financial uh, where our FASO officers step in to protect to make sure that we where we can protect the victim. But if a thousand people across North Wales have had that phone call and been scammed, it's quite a big fraud, isn't it? Potentially, yes. And but if if the if the offender is in another part of the country, then the offence has actually been committed in that part of the country and not here. You are a victim, but the actual offending is happening elsewhere. This is where I mentioned earlier about having limited boundaries. Yeah, yeah. That is the whole purpose of, of gathering all this information and having a central bureau that is able to disseminate the matters to the, to the appropriate effects. Are you satisfied that on a national level enough has been done to detect the crime? Uh, it's always uh, an ongoing process. Um, obviously, the drive it nationally now is to have the closer working relationships between the fraud stream, cybercrime, money laundering. Um, in that basis, um, police forces are being encouraged to set up, if they haven't done so already, economic crime units so that there is that level of experience within each force. We in North Wales are obviously ahead of quite a few forces, if, if I'm being honest in that respect. Um, and as part of that process, the City of London have constantly um, assessing how we're dealing with um, this type of area. As I said to you earlier, they're the lead force. Um, so we take our direction from them in making sure that we've got the processes in place to deal with it. Okay, right, thanks, thanks. And the National Crime Agency, are they the prime lead agency for fraud in the country now? Yeah, so the National Economic Crime Centre, which is part of the NCA, have the that responsibility. Okay, thank, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Yana. I'm trying to get my head around it, you know, what, yeah. what, what I think. Anybody got any questions at all? Chris? Yes, sir. I'd like to thank Yana for the... Uh, the, the uh, presentation today. Uh, I wonder would it be possible to have uh, copies of the, uh, the the slides and so on because again I certainly couldn't see them from yeah. I'm sitting and I'm sure there's a lot of useful information there. Um, the, the, the other point is you know that uh, it, it is a complex area as you have said and uh, you know from what my, my understanding from what I've read much of this actually stems from abroad rather than from this country. So I, I'm just wondering to what extent that is the case, you know, in terms of proportion of these particular cyber crimes which emanate mm -hmm. from foreign countries. And secondly, you know, what is the success rate really in dealing with our own internal uh, cyber initiated crimes and those that are coming from abroad? Thank you. 
Thank you. That's that's an appropriate question. So, in terms of international liaison, national crime agency are responsible for that. Um, some of you will have seen the quite shocking case in America recently, where a young man was targeted. Um, he taken intimate photos of himself, shared them with a scammer, um, and within six hours of that contact, had sadly took his own life. Um, that is a crime where they are after the money as much as anything else. Um, there's somebody I knew who, whose son was impacted in that way. Obviously, the mother rang me um, and said, what do I do? Well, I said, the, f the first thing you need to remember is you're in a good position because your son has told you about it. He's confided in you. So that risk to him as an individual is greatly reduced. Um, America, being America, have already extradited and put before a court the two 21-year-old brothers from Nigeria that were responsible for that. So in terms of international crime, the NCA have the responsibility to liaise with law enforcement in places like uh, West Africa to try and deter people and reduce the impact. There are certain... Uh, jurisdictions in the, in the world where we have no um, influence at all at the moment. And I'm sure we, we can guess which ones those are. Um, so it's very much a case as at a level of North Wales Police. Our responsibility is to make sure that our protect functions, the advice that we are giving through the likes of Dewi and his colleagues, is up to date, current, and is advising those individuals of the steps that you need to take to stop those criminals, whichever um, area of the world they are, from um, from committing those crimes or impacting the individual or the business. And that's why things like the Cyber Resilience Centre are so important um, for businesses. Uh, in terms of proportion of um, cases of success abroad, they're not going to be very high. Okay, So I can only answer the figures, uh, the frauds that we have been responsible for investigating in North Wales. So as I said, a judicial outcome in North Wales of 8.1% over a five year, as a five year average, gives you an example of, 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 of that. But those are the, you know, that is also the, the fact that those are, are cases that we can say that the offender is in North Wales. Okay, so it is a challenging picture and that's why the protect function of um, financial crime is so important. Yeah. Yeah, in, in terms of messages on WhatsApp, you, you've got sort of a group of school children. They're in a WhatsApp group, they're messaging one another, and all of a sudden the messages start to get a little bit naughty and there might be some hate crime there or whatever. Would you, first of all, know about that? And if you did know about it, what, what would you actually do about it? Okay, so... Um, that falls into the more the digital media investigation side of things. It depends on the circumstances. So if we're talking about a WhatsApp group where um, a number of individuals are involved and there's some hate speech, um, it is likely that we would know about it if an individual within that group reported it or if a device involved in that conversation um, came into law enforcement's hands from another from another investigation yeah um obviously there is also the the element of criminals joining such chats um be on whichever platform it is invariably in those circumstances the individuals within the group are more likely to report that than if it is a conversation within a group of peers shall we say thank you very much for that. any of you got any questions at all okay Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it was in-depth, and I certainly enjoyed it, and it gives us a lot to think about, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, I think you've done a great job in terms of prevent, but I think it just shows how difficult it is to actually catch the ones who are actually perpetrating the crime. But thanks so much, Alain. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, if we move on now to item eight, to consider reports by the North Wales Police and Crime Commissioner. Uh, item 8A, the Police and Crime Commissioner's annual report 2023 to 2024, which are pages 9 
26. And I understand the police commissioner will present this item. Yeah, Doctor, uh, yeah uh, before I move A and B, I just want to place some record my thanks to the team within the OPCC uh, and also to North Wales Police. So I'll move A and B and happy to take any questions members may have. Dioch. Have we got any questions at all from the Commission? Yes, Shana. Dioch, I'm going to be Sal's Petisolwepi. I have um, a few things I'd like to raise on the annual report to start with. And also on the following report, I'll try and speak slowly so that the translator can keep up with me. Firstly, on page number 11 of the report, which is uh, uh, number 11 in the pack, it talks about uh, uh, events, incidents attended. And there's not a large percentage against this compared to the other things. I just wanted to ask why and if you have any further information about this. The next one is page 15. I was glad to see that the uh, crime percentage was uh, uh, getting lower uh, generally. I'm sure everybody's glad to see that. But is that due to the success of your plan or the... Um, fall in the number of uh, incidents reported. And then on to page 24. And this talks about justice, reformative justice. I was disappointed to see a delay in cases being considered. I'm glad that the communication is improving, but my question is, if victims are receiving the justice and if they, whether or not they actually receive the justice they deserve in a timely period. And there's a picture here as well. I'm not sure what that's meant to be displaying. It's not very clear to me anyway. And then on page 25, it talks about uh, efficiencies and underspend of an underspend of one million pounds on uh, buildings. Does that mean that they're not being maintained effectively? And I do have more uh, comments on the other uh, reports, but would you like to deal with these first? Sorry, well, I should have put my microphone then. So apologies for that. So, yeah, Dioch, uh, page 11 regarding the incidents attended, I think I'll leave that to the the Chief Constable to answer. The crime crime down, but why, uh, on page 15 as, as well. So let me just get these up. Just bear with me one moment. I think question, so for the second question on page 15, why is crime down? Uh, is it down to the police and crime plan? Well, what I think it's it's that strong constructive way that we've been having the deep dives with the when we have our strategic executive board meetings with the force, where we're able to put that challenge to them. We analyse, we scrutinise how well the force is performing, which is, is seeing those results that you've got on the on the page, as well as other things going on in our office, such as how much significantly our engagement and communications have improved, uh, the introduction of victims panels, our surgeries. We ha we've also introduced uh, online surgeries as well, and we had our first one last week. So I think all these things that 
that only the OPCC are doing, but also the activities that the force has undertaken as well is really benefiting the public of North Wales in in its sort of true sense. So I think it's it's a bit of both. So I hope that answers that that question. Uh, yeah, with the uh, restorative, restorative justice and rehub, we were really disappointed as well. Uh, I'm glad Rianne's here behind because we we asked uh, for why these delays were taking so long. Uh, really prominent, as you will know, uh, in my police and crime plan about restorative justice and how we can in increase the use of restor restorative justice. We know that the outcomes from that are better, not only, you know, more importantly, for the for the victim of, of the crime, but also fiscally as well. You're getting more value for money, so it just makes sense uh, to why we're, we're so passionate about it. Uh, we had our meeting. We're still... I'm not too sure where we're up to at, at this moment in time, but there is there were some delays due to the officer allocated in the in the restorative justice department. Have you got anything else to add to that, Leon? No, it's very much ongoing work, and um, yeah, we're, we're still working closely with the restorative justice team to try and ensure those those delays are kept to a minimum. Yeah, that's about so. And with regard to the, the £1 million underspend, uh, Kate, I'm sure, will pick that up on 8C. Dioch. Unless you want me to pick it up now. Pick it up now. Um, so the underspend on the states, the majority of the underspend related to energy costs. So it's partly to do with price and partly to do with volume on that. Um, um, we managed to buy our electricity cheaper than we thought we would and the remainder is by funding some of the planned maintenance work from the reserve rather than from the annual budget. Thanks Kate. Chris, Councillor Biffle. Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first question. Was it about the amount of incidents? Uh, sorry, the amount of incidents versus 101 calls and 909 calls? Yes, it's the incidents attended and there's no percentage next to it to compare a comparative percentage, which there are on the other data that you've got in the report. Yeah, no. OK, that's uh, that's fine. So, so obviously... Um, it not being my um, report, I'm not sure why we didn't put that into a percentage. We can do. Uh, what I would say in terms of just, um, I suppose, the comparator, because that's what stands out when you look at it. It looks like we've had a lot of things come in and we've attended very few. I think that's probably where, where you're coming from. So 101 calls and 999 calls. We'll have quite a lot of repeat calls. We'll have a lot of calls for other agencies. We'll have a lot of people ringing up um, to uh, that, that perhaps we need to redirect, especially uh, ambulance service at the moment. That's sort of quite a high demand in terms of uh, some of the calls we get in. On the 101 calls, you get a lot of people ringing in to chase um, things they've already reported or to ask for an officer update or for other reasons. So percentage wise, I would imagine that will bring that number down. And when you actually look at the amount of incidents that get dialed in that we need to attend, uh, we we also deal with some things by way of uh, appointment. Sometimes that's over the phone, sometimes by video call, because that's the most convenient way for that person to be dealt with by their request. So there are a number of ways that we attend to and deal with incidents. We can certainly look at breaking that down if that's helpful, uh, Commissioner, by working with your office um, to look at how we can do that. So you can see that in probably a more helpful way. Would, would that be okay? And then just in terms of the uh, reductions, I'm really proud of the reductions actually. And I take some real heart in the fact that I know that we've just been through a lot of external inspection. And I know that those inspectorates have found that we record crime um, you know, very, very accurately. When you ring in and there's a crime to be uh, reported, we report that and our accuracy levels are very high, which is why I'm quite confident around the incidents attending. We're going to the things that we need to go to uh, to gather the, the evidence in relation to it. Um, the priorities that I put in place around vis visibility and engagement, around fighting uh, crime, doing the basics, getting out there and making sure that we're investigating um, and, and also about treating our victims, uh, you know, uh, 
properly, uh, updating people, etc. You know, I think have started to really uh, resonate with our workforce. And so we're seeing a reduction because we're out, visible, we're proactively dealing with things. And we're also seeing a better response in relation to offences, which means that people are being identified quickly. We use lots and lots of ways of investigating crime. So I'd like to think that plays its part, um, it would, you know, rather than it just being down to look. Um, and I think if that was the case, you'd see that reflected across the country. And you see us as outliers and first in the country for a number of areas of reductions. So I think, you know, um, the priorities that I've set, the Policing Crime Commissioner's plan and the, the way that those two things work together are effectively helping us drive down crime with our overall ambition of making North Wales the safest place to live, work and visit. Uh, that's very clearly on the minds of each one of our officers and staff every day. Dioc, thank you. Thank you, Chief Constable. Councillor Bittle, Chris. Yes, thank you. Um, on page 10, uh, paragraph 3, the recorded incidents of crime are reduced by 13%. I think that's very uh, encouraging to see that. Um, uh, but I just wanted to know, really, from what baseline uh, are, we, are we talking about, really? And what is the percentage of um, uh, positive outcomes increased by over 2%, but 2% of what, really? I think that might have been useful, that information has been given as well. On page 11, it mentions... Uh, the 999 calls of 119,552, up 12%. The 101 up calls are only up by 3%. I'm just wondering how many people actually go to 999 because they can't get a response from 101. I've actually you know, heard people saying that anecdotally, if you can't get an answer at 101, and we know some of the difficulties that arise with that sometimes, if people don't get a, a very quick or an immediate response, which is impos impossible, they go to 999 as a consequence. I'm just wondering to what extent that is uh, that is true. Um, in terms of the third priority, a fair, efficient criminal justice system, uh, restorative justice is mentioned there. And again, we've uh, the Police and Crime Commissioner has emphasised this in the past, really, and uh, as a, an authority, uh, as a as a force, we've encouraged this. And again, with the present circumstances in the prison system, where people have been, have been released early and so on, I think it's very, very important that we actually look at alternative ways and means of dealing with criminal activity where appropriate, uh, and actually dealing without sending people to prison, because again, from the figures we've seen in the past, you know, very often the, 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 those who have been involved have not returned to crime by and large. Uh, the, 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 the figures are encouraging mm -hmm. in that particular route. So I think that's uh, that's that's encouraging to see. Um, the um, the issue uh, uh, regarding um, 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 retail crime is mentioned here. You know, and I'm just wondering to what extent uh, shoplifting has been raised with the police and crime commissioner in the discussions that he's had. He mentions in the report he's visited Tesco's and Boots and uh, Iceland and so on, which is good. But again, we know for a fact, you know, from news reports that it's very often a small corner shop that's been hit by shoplifters and so on. And again, it's quite aggressive and uh, violent in many, many cases. I'm just wondering to what extent this has come through as a factor in North Wales and how we're dealing with that. Because again, uh, uh, the, the, the figures for this don't seem to appear in the report. And again, it is a national issue. Um, in, in terms of hate crime, again, you know, obviously this report, I think, was, although we're looking at two reports here, aren't we? The original report was up to April, up to March uh, 2024. And of course, much of the problems that we've seen in August this year have come later. But the second report here, B, uh, 8B, is actually relating to the first couple of quarters of this year. I'm just wondering to what extent, you know, there's been a significant rise in this. You know, fortunately, we weren't on the receiving end of much of what the rest of the country saw during the August disturbances and riots, violent riots. But again, I, I know from news reports and so on that people from North Wales were arrested for incitement of violence and so on. Uh, I'm just wondering to what extent this featured at all, really, in, in North Wales, according to the police. Um, 
the other question I wanted to relate in, in, in 8B is relates to the um, the improvements in road safety that Cambridge is one of your priorities. And I'm just wondering to what extent, if any, 20 mile an hour zones have had any impact really in terms of accidents in North Wales and serious accidents in particular. You know, is there any evidence that that has been a result of this? I'm getting a lot of messages, I think other councillors probably are too, in terms of the review that's going on. You know, many people welcome this and they didn't want the 20 mile an hour zones in the first place. But again, I'm getting communications from people, you know, concerned about us going back to the 30 mile an hour limits in certain areas because they feel far more comfortable and safer for themselves and their children in those particular areas and have noticed an improvement. I'm just wondering whether there's any evidence from the police in that respect. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, dear Chris, uh, just a few questions there, wasn't it? So we'll take... We'll take care. Uh, that's good. It's good to have questions, uh, and I really appreciate that and welcome that. So thank Dioc for that. Uh, so regarding the uh, the uh, baseline for the percentage of crime being reduced, that is year to date, as far as I know. Happy to be corrected by the chief principal, but to my knowledge, that is year to date. Uh, Mr. of Justice and other ways of dealing with crime. I'm really excited with the appointment of Lord Simpson going into the Ministry of Justice, because uh, I think he's got some really innovative ways of rehabilitating uh, those who've chosen uh, a bumpy path. Uh, and I think we, we're quite aware of that, of the activity that he's done prior to him being appointed in in the House of Lords. So I'm really excited to see what comes over from, from that. Seeing that, I've also been involved with a lot of, uh, as you'll know, with the... Uh, and they've been coming out of probation and other you know, the community initiatives as well, where they the community payback schemes, such as visiting uh, the World Garden in Arias Park, uh, the places further down the coast in, in, in Bangor uh, as well. So I'm really keen in, in seeing this develop further. Uh, the retail crime, yes, uh, significant more engagement, and I was pleased to meet with the Minister of the Social social partnership over in Bangor, as outlined in the report. Uh, but it's not just the big retailers, because they will have more financial support to embark on other activities, such as they've done regarding Mighty, which the Chief Constable uh, leads on nationally with the, with the responsibilities in the MPCC. But there is other organisations, such as ACS, or the Association of Convenience Stores. There's also the Federation of Independent Retailers, that I've had really positive engagement with them, looking to be working with them uh, as well, because often you find that our independent retailers, they're not, they're not as not as uh, many as they, they used to be, uh, and the number of independent retailers along our high streets is diminished dram dramatically. So supporting our local independent retailers, often you find that they're a family business as well. They employ local people as... Uh, a lot of things that a lot of things go on there about stimulating the local economy there. I don't want them feeling as though they're being left behind. Far from that. Uh, so the discussions I've had with the ACS, with the Fed Federation as well, as well as taking on that joint lead responsibilities within the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners with retail crimes, working with my counterpart uh, in uh, uh, Surrey, uh, PCC Katie Bourne, We'll be able to work together in making sure that they will not be forgotten about at all. And like I said, with the chief's uh, responsibilities there, she's well aware of the activity that I've been taking out as well in supporting our our smaller shops. Uh, the riots, uh, I think we did a, a we did a sterling job in North Wales. First and foremost, a lot of proactive work. Uh, the force were the force were really proactive in identifying potential perpetrators of crimes and dealing with it very effectively. Myself and the Chief were in commu constant communication daily, uh, keeping, us a, keeping me abreast of, of things, as well as informing our local MPs uh, and local authority, Chief Executives as well. So all that communication side of things was really, really strong. Uh, and I think in Wales, you know, let's not forget, we there was not one riot in Wales. Uh, on my own sort of personal view on that, I think with the Welsh Government, putting that commitment into being a nation of sanctuary as well contributed 
to that sense of feeling where where there's more of a togetherness in Wales than they may, than some may feel over in in England. I think that's played a part as well. Uh, and finally, with the with the twenty mile an hour and the impact that's had, I haven't got those figures to hand. I'm not sure if the chief constable will be able to provide more substantive answer to that question. But unfortunately, I haven't got that to to hand at this moment. But if, I, if the chief got answered it, we we can certainly get that to you as well. Thank you. Um, so with the 20 mile an hour, the majority of our enforcement of it has been around the areas you would expect and anticipate for us to be doing that in schools, um, you know, those areas that are very vulnerable. Um, and obviously, um, you know, from a feedback point of view, it's been a really challenging and difficult area that's been um, an ongoing engagement with communities around. Um, in terms of being able to identify whether it has made a difference to road casualties, we would have to go away and have a look at that. I haven't got any evidence of that at this time. I would say that a lot of our serious road traffic collisions happen on our fast roads um, and happen, as we know, around things that we, um, you know, sort of do a lot of work around prevention of Darwin motorcyclists. Um, so, but we can definitely go away, Councillor Griffith, and have a look at that for you and give you some substantive feedback. Um, but at this moment in time, there is nothing that I've seen in all the reports that I've had that's indicated uh, that to be the case. Um, but the engagement and I think support for us um, enforcing around our schools, particularly hospitals, areas where we've got vulnerable communities has been quite strong. the retail crime and again the shoplifting in particular uh, could we have figures for that you know, because again you know according to news reports nationally this is quite a, a critical issue and again you know the the police and crime commissioner was mentioning the, the number of small shops and so on disappearing from our high streets and elsewhere you know this this kind of thing will actually exacerbate that won't it if it's not uh, stopped as it were so Good again, it might be useful to have some figures for that in a future meeting. Yeah, well, we we can certainly get them over to you, Chris. And yeah, uh, it's ha it's really useful to have that uh, as well for you to to scrutinise how I'm performing as well. So yeah, no no problem at all in in bringing that that forward. Uh, yeah, uh, I know how important retail crime is and how dramatically that has increased uh, these you know certainly the last twelve months and really focused me on form part of my uh, election campaign, in fact, to, to see what we can be doing within, what further work we can be doing uh, within the retail sector and things within the OPCC, which would, which would complement and support what work the force are doing as well. So very keen to do that. So yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Just for your information, I submitted a written question to the commissioner this last week on shoplifting and what the force's policy on it are. And I see some statistics on it as well. So we'll get that due course anyway. Um, I've just got one, one question, if I may, to the Chief Constable, really, yeah. uh, on the web chats. What do people talk about on web chats? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so people um, use web chat to ask us questions, to report things on. Um, so it's, it's just almost like text, but on on the web really um so it's, it's a, a a new way of being able to contact us perhaps whilst you're busy at work you want to report something to us then you can get on with that and get on with some work you're not hanging on the phone uh i note the court the question around the 101s um you know that's a, an area we scrutinize absolutely every day in terms of have we got our call takers at the right numbers you know uh, people will often abandon a 101 call to go on to web chat um you know so uh, when we look at attrition rates is it because people are choosing another way of contacting us sometimes you know we don't want people to think oh, actually i don't want to hold on 101 anymore i'll ring on the nines especially when it's not a treble nine issue so offering all of those different avenues for pe pe people to be able to contact us allows us to be able to take reports in different ways so and i just add on on the retail um crime side of things um we've done quite a lot of work with grocer magazine uh who support a lot of the independent um grocers uh, up and down the country um and we've also done quite a lot of work in terms of our local policing teams to make sure we've got that visibility right in our local communities. Our attendance, especially where, um, as I 
um, obviously, uh, you know, made a, a promise to in relation to attendance. Our attendance where there's violence offered, there's evidence to be captured. Uh, you know, when we've, when we've dipped sampled that, we've been at 100% attendance. We've also been using things like community behaviour orders in relation to persistent offenders, perhaps those who have alcohol and drug issues and are going, it doesn't really matter whether it's a co-op or a Tesco or an independent trader. They're causing a nuisance, a problem and they're damaging um, business and they're damaging the, the, the local community from a fear of crime point of view. We've taken a, you know, a pretty zero tolerance approach in relation to those individuals. So we've had a number of successful community behaviour orders and breaches of those, which have meant that we've been able to push that person towards um, a, a more significant way of controlling their criminality. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chief Constable. Thank you. Any other questions at all for the questioner? Yeah, Shana? Yeah, sorry, Annie, I'm not all. I'm going to I was just going to come back um, on a few things for uh, Report 8B, which is the update from the Commissioner. On page 28, you talk about uh, policing in the community. I just found it quite interesting that there was a, a rise in the, court, in the demand there where the crimes... Um, generally has decreased, but I think that might be to do with the work you're, you're doing in the community, and I've really had my answer to that already. Also, on page 32, you're talking about people who uh, take part in crime and the committee you have. I assume that the pro probationary uh, service is part of this. And on page 43, um, um, with regards to visiting um, holding areas. Have they had training and have they started to visit? So three quite simple things there, hopefully. Thank you so much. Can I first ask for uh, uh, debate now for a proposal and a seconder in terms of the annual report from pages 9 to 26, then we'll come on to that after. Can we propose it? Thank you. A seconder? Thank you. And then, so we've got to item H. No, oh, show of hands, please, yeah. Let me see, get something in there. <laughs> item 8B, then, please. The periodic update by the North Wales Police and Crime Commissioner, which is pages 27 to 45. Commissioner? Yeah, Dioc, uh, as before, Sarah, happy to move in. Uh, place on record again. My thanks to the team in the OPCC and also North Wales Police Force. Dioc. Yeah, do, do you wish to uh, address Shana's questions, Commissioner? Oh, I've got you wrong, Commissioner. Commissioner? Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry, yeah. do you wish to address Shana's questions? Yeah, so uh, I'll just pass that over to uh, so the police and the community, what was it, on page 28? So, uh, Rianne's going to take the uh, people who offend question. So, we'll just bear with me one moment. Thank you. And, uh, good afternoon. Um, yes, we've we've set up a, um, a people who offend subgroup in North Wales, and that sits underneath the North Wales Criminal Justice Board, which the Commissioner chairs. Um, there's, there's actually one of these people who offend subgroups in all four of the regions across Wales and it sits underneath the all Wales people who offend um, task force. Our subgroup in North Wales is actually chaired by our Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner Wayne Jones and yes it is, we've got representation from probation on that group, we've got representation from the force, from CPS on that group. And what we're seeking to achieve is we, we've carried out some analysis across the area of who our offenders are. So we've done an analysis of how old they are, um, what sex they are, and, and what their offending behaviour looks like. So we hope to be in a position where we know what our offenders' needs are, and then we then look at how do we address those needs. So be it housing, be it mental health. And then the whole purpose of that group is that we build up a picture of where the gaps are where those needs are, so that we can work collaboratively across Wales to address those those needs. So 
well, and potentially will we'll then look at a reduction in reoffending. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to bring the chief executive as well for the uh, the custody question. Uh, so I can confirm the uh, the custody visitors have now completed their training and uh, and have started uh, undertaking visits as well. And in fact, uh, by coincidence, there's a there's a meeting tomorrow evening of our, all our custody visitors, uh, which we carry out on a quarterly basis as well. Thank you, Wayne. Understand that. Yeah, sorry, just to go back to the people who offend Workstream, uh, it features within the local criminal justice board agenda. And as Rihanna said, there is a separate subgroup for Wales now looking at that. So we've identified violence, antisocial behaviour and drug use as the three main drivers for offending. So one of the other key things that we do in the group is we're looking that commission services are being focused on those areas so things that are commissioned through sort of the area planning board, things that we look at that come into the police and crime commissioner's office for offending, and then some of the things that are delivered by some of the commissioned services. So they're actually focusing on those key areas that have been identified through um, data analysis. Thank you. Yeah, catch them. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wonder whether uh, the police and crime commissioner could elaborate on uh, the issue on page 28 of neighbourhood policing. I think we've all given great emphasis to the need for this and the effectiveness of this in the past. And again, in relation to bullet point number one, in particular, the declining number of permanent neighbourhood police officers. I'm just wondering why that is the case, really. It's not, it's not obvious to me. Uh, I might have missed something. But again, is this not an, an operational deployment issue? You know, where officers are being put on to something else as opposed to neighbourhood policing. Uh, that might be the case, it might not be, but I'd be grateful if I could have a comment from the Police and Crime Commissioner and the Chief Constable. Thank you. So, Chris, uh, that's not just a, a local issue. That's the case for each uh, police authority in England and Wales, so I just want to be uh, really clear on that. Uh, it's been a real challenging time with we know exactly especially with long standards members of, of this policing and crime panel uh with with uplift and trying to recruit and attrition retention uh there's been a lot of work going on which i'm sure the chief constable will talk about more things such as uh, a new initiative uh called uh, say and stay uh, which seems to be quite popular, but as I said, that's that's quite operational. So if I just hand over to the, the Chief Constable for that question, please. Thank you, Commissioner. So that's a national issue, isn't it, in terms of the neighbourhood um, policing reductions? What I would say is that um, that's not a position that we are um, supporting in North Wales. The neighbourhood policing teams are staying at the same numbers and we are recruiting into those neighbourhood policing teams on an ongoing basis. We've made a decision in relation to PCSOs, so we don't see a reduction in relation to those areas. Our attrition rate is the lowest in the country. Um, and, you know, we've put the schemes in like stay and say, st uh, say and stay. So if there was any reason somebody was thinking of leaving, they were in a position to be able to really address that. That's part of the work that we've done around culture across North Wales. Um, so we aren't seeing that sort of reduction that other forces are seeing, and we're seeing ourselves in a good place. Uh, we are hitting our uh, numbers in relation to uh, uplift. Uh, we haven't dipped in relation to those. We've got a good tra trajectory in relation to people who are joining us, coming in. We've opened up all of the pathways in relation to recruitment, so it's not just degree entry, those with a degree but those who are seeking to join us who haven't got a degree and don't want a degree. Um, we feel that there's an opportunity and a place for um, you know, people who uh, want to serve their communities and want to have a long-standing relationship. We've done work around the Welsh language to make sure that we are also making uh, the opportunity to recruit from all of our communities across North Wales. Um, so we've got a full commitment in relation to our candidates and the people that will have those long-serving community relationships 
across uh, the force uh, with a real commitment off me that neighbourhood policing is not going to be an area that suffers um, and we will use everything that we possibly can that's out there in terms of neighbourhood policing programmes um, you know, in, in order to make sure that we've got um, that full commitment but I hope that gives you some reassurance Councillor Bithell. Chair, before we go, I probably just want to take this opportunity as well for, uh, which I'm sure members have had already, is to partake in the Police and Crime Plan public consultation. And you will see there that neighbourhood policing as at the heart of that Police and Crime Plan, just as it was uh, in, in my last tenure. Uh, but look, there's some, some interesting questions there that I'm putting to the people. Uh, I'm really looking forward to what responses we get from the public. Uh, yeah, Thank you, Chair. Councillor Nunn, David, do you have a question? Yeah, um, Thank you. I'll just wait a few seconds so that you can put your headsets on. We have all heard uh, about a week ago that some prisoners have been released early before the end of the uh, period. Uh, just to try and cut down on the overload in these uh, prisons. So I have two questions. What effect will this decision have on policing in our communities here in North Wales? And secondly, isn't this movement um, sort of uh, undermining the hard work of the police and the uh legal system we have to collect the uh, evidence to um send these into prison in the first place thank you yeah so uh thank you for the question so uh sds so the standard determination sentences they were reduced from 50 percent to 40 percent and that was just to address the pressures building on the the prison estate uh if memory serves me right, the the impact on North Wales is very minimal. That we're looking at, at this latest, the, the ones that have just been released, the numbers are around 11, but there's been a lot of work going on between uh, police and crime commissioners across, across Wales, uh, the CPS, local criminal justice boards as well, uh, other partner agencies uh, in how we support from coming in into our communities and whilst I recognise the what you're saying there regarding the hard work that police officers have taken and the justice system for them to be released uh, I think this really goes to show the lack of investment and the lack of proactive work by uh, previous government in how we can be dealing with this we've touched on things there that could alleviate that pressure we we're talking about restorative justice earlier, how that how that could affect the number of people going into into prison. Uh, but we uh, we've done a, a tremendous amount of work there. We're we're also looking to be meeting with the governor in Berwyn next week about what can be done to support those who were uh, on the. Uh, what the scribes to as well so those who are on uh, control substances uh, to try and make sure that they are getting the right wrap, right wrap, wrap around support for them to be integrated into our communities as well so uh, although I understand why people would be very anxious about this uh, was we all would wouldn't we uh, I've been given sufficient assurances in what the CPS, probation, and all the partner agencies are, are doing to, to make sure it's well managed. Thank you. Do any members have any further questions on this? Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I ask for a proposal? Yeah. Yes, seconder. Hello. Thank you. And can I have a show of hands, please? No. Thank you very much. We move on to item 8C which is an update on the 2024-25 budget, with pages 46 to 61. Mm -hmm. Rob to Kate for this. Thank you, Kate. 
Amanda Bow, Maya Drago, Bach Blaen. Um, I'm going to assume that everyone has had the opportunity to read through the report and the introduction to the 2023-2024 accounts. So I'll jump straight in with updates since the report was written. Uh, the audit of the 2023-2024 accounts is almost complete. No major items have been identified um, no, for change and no changes to the main statements are required at this point. Um, this means that the usable reserves position, as summarised on page 3 of the introduction to the accounts, which is on page 57 of the panel papers pack, is unchanged. We remain on track to be able to sign the audited accounts by the end of October. Um, so I'm going to ask for pause at this point for any questions. Any questions at all? No. No, okay. So regarding the 2024-2025... Sorry. Sorry, sorry, Kate. It's just in relation to 4.5, the employees projected underspend of 370,000. It mentions there that the anticipated in-year impact of the 4.75% increase for police officers and uh, these money actually budgeted for 2.5%. Uh, it mentions the fact that uh, some of this will result in, well, well, some of this will be met by uh, a government contribution of 175 million nationally. I'm just wondering how that works out locally, really. Will that cover the actual uh, rise in pay for our officers or will that have uh, uh, other impacts elsewhere on our budget in order to meet that? Right, I was just going to, uh, you've preempted me because I was just asked a question for last year's accounts. Um, so if I just carry on with where I am, and I am actually planning to cover that. So um, the projections for this year, members will know that the at the time of writing, the current estimate of the variance was around £5,000 underspend, which is as near to bang on as you can get on a £200 million budget. However, um, We've been able to estimate the impact of 4.75% increase in police officer pay from the 1st of September, and we are assuming a similar increase for staff because that's the way it generally goes. So the government announced an additional grant of £175 million nationally towards the increased expenditure because um, our MTFP, along with the average nationally, was for a 2.5% assumed pay increase. Uh, today... The Home Office has announced the allocation of the £175 million. £11 million of it is top sliced away before we see it. So there is £164 million to be allocated and they are doing that in line with the general funding formula. So in the report we had assumed income of £1.805 million for um, funding from the Home Office to towards the pay increase, we're actually getting £1.687 million. Um, so that is £118,000 difference than in the report. Um, if all else were unchanged, that would leave us at an, an overspend position of £113,000 as of today. Um, so... As I've just said, we previously assumed in the MTFP a 2.5% pay increase without a need for any additional top-up. Compared to that position, um, we're approximately £665,000 worse off today as a result of the higher pay increase not being fully funded for North Wales. Does that answer that question? Um, Noted in the report, we've got £300,000 additional income receivable as a result of receiving £22.5 million in floor grant in full on the 1st of April um, and being able to invest that um, in one go. And we've wired that to fund capital contributions. The capital budget for the year is likely to be overstated, although the overall programme, including the slippage, remains at £56 million. I've requested that those responsible for managing the projects align the timing of the budgets with their anticipated delivery of them. Um, so while some elements are going to be difficult for 
people are ent to control or influence in terms of timing, it is helpful from a financial and operational standpoint to have a more accurate estimate of when projects might be taking place. So are there any questions regarding this year's revenue or capital? Uh, thanks for the report and for the, the, the update, which is obviously is, is fresh on your desk. So, um, um, uh, But you've got six months to find £665,000. Is, is that correct? It's actually you? more than that because that's just a seven-month impact of it. Right. Um, the Home Office in their letter did say that they would be trying to address the full year impact of it for 2025-2026. Um, we can um, manage it for this year. We have... Our reserves are in quite a healthy state, so we can manage £100,000 of overspend this year. But obviously, we need to make sure that we're in a good position on an ongoing basis. What was the line they used for 25-26? What did they say? That they would... Did that, they would... Sounded like a governmental line. I didn't quite understand. Bear with me. <laughs> I'm aware that the 2024-2025 pay award creates a funding pressure in 2025-2026 and look to resolve this through the upcoming spending review. Oh, okay. Wait and see then. So, um, but obviously the 655,000 shortfall is a seven month impact, so it's going to be over a million pounds for a 12 month impact of that. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll leave it in your capable hands to do some uh, magic with the figures and, and, and get back to us accordingly. Thank you. Okay, and um, just to finish off, um, the audit committee has been continuing uh, to work as usual. The next meeting will be on the 25th of September. Um, there's a single purpose meeting to sign the audited accounts that's scheduled for the 31st of October. We had a new member start as planned and she has attended Jack and our intern Government, joint governance board. So, any final questions? Thank you, Kate. Anybody, any questions at all? Um, there was just one more about the clarification of the civilian uh, pay, pay rise that we discussed last week when, when we met. So, where, where are we with that in terms of timing? Um, we're awaiting information from the Police Staff Pay Council. Um, but in all the time I've been doing this job, and they have generally come out with the same percentage increase that has been awarded to officers. So that's our assumption. And so if, if that's 4.75, that will be fully funded by some pot? No, that will be for us to find. But no, there's no more funding from the Home Office other than our share of the 164 million. OK, well, we'll touch base next few months once you've worked out what that means. Thank you. So sorry. We have assumed 4.75% in our calculation, so it's only if it's different. But thank you. Any other questions at all? Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask the proposer and the seconder to note the report, please? Louise and Chris, thank you. And can I ask members to show their hand? Mr. Bibby, thank you very much. So item nine is to consider reports by the host authority which is the North West Police and Crime Panel end of year monitoring report, 1st of April 2023 to the 1st of March, sorry, to the 31st of March 2024. It's pages 62 to 77, and it's over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so as required by the PCP grant agreement, the PCP must publish details of its expenditure on an annual basis. So the report, bef the report before you provides details of the end of year claim, for the PCP grant and the associated expenditure, including member expenses. As you can see from the report, the grant was not fully utilised due to the two elections. Um, however, this does mean that Conway does not have to uh, incur any additional costs. So any costs that, any costs that go above the grant, Conway have to absorb. Uh, the report also includes its annual report, which has been submitted to the Home, of or Home Office alongside the grant, and this includes details of the number of meetings, documents and publications we produced. That's it, Chair. Thank you. Any questions at all? Yeah, Shanae. In points back, yeah, and I'd remember what just we were Just more can... points, and I'm not sure if I've um, misanalyzed this. The last point regarding translation and the costs 
a link to this. The grant says it says that the grant is just over five thousand, but the cost is less than that. Uh, 5,230, even though they said that the costs have exceeded the grant. I just don't understand this. May, it's, it might just be me. I picked on the same thing, really. It's uh, 485 pound less than what we've been allowed. So we've saved some money. Yeah. Oh, I'd have to check with our translation. I don't deal with the translation costs that I've just normally given them. So, um, so yeah, I'd have to check. Yeah. I take it though that if we haven't spent all the money, we can't carry it over, no? No, we're not actually given the grants. We just claim it. So uh, we can only claim for expenditure that we've actually spent. So. Any questions at all, Edgar? I'd like to do away with expense altogether if everybody learned Welsh. You don't need English. Yeah. <laughs> <Don't you? laughs> Thank you. Can I ask for a proposal and a second and then to note the report? Ask members to show their hands. Thank you. Now, item 9B, to consider the forward work programme for the North West Police and Crime Panel, pages 78 to 79. If it's all against the index. Thanks, Chair. So the forward plan has been populated for the year with all the usual standing items. Um, I will liaise with the Chair and Stephen um, to schedule any other items that may come forward. But I noticed that there is an item carried over from last year relating to the PCP's vision for restorative justice, which is a lot of what we've been discussing today. So I think that was on the forward plan for the end of last year, and I don't think we've got a date for that. So I'll liaise with the Chair and Stephen on that one. Also, I just want to advise you that there will be a special meeting of the panel on the 24th of October um, in order to uh, appoint our co-opted independent members. As you're aware, we've gone out to Advit on Friday as the uh, term of office for our co-opted independent members comes to end on the 31st of October. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Stephen. Thanks, Chair. Can I just confirm something for the December meeting? Um, it, at that time, it will be 12 months since you had the uh, last annual update from Checkpoint. Uh, just to clarify, is, is that something they would wish to see repeated at the uh, December meeting? If so, I can make those arrangements. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Date of next meeting is the 24th of October. For that's the special meeting. And then the normal meeting, uh, the next normal meeting will be on the 16th of December. Okay, so that concludes the meeting for today. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Thank you.